गुड मॉर्निंग पार्टिसिपेंट्स I hope you are all able to hear and see me. If anyone has any audio or video problem, you can, can please point out now before we start today's session. So we will start today with the last exercise on the on leasing. So the exercise is on your screen and equipment is leased for 3 years. The equipment's cost to the lesser is 35,000. A deposit of 2,000 is payable at the inception of the lease and is to be followed by 6 half yearly installments of 6,500. Payable in a year, that means first installment payable at the end of 6 months second installment payable at the end of one year period and so on. Commencing at the end of first six months. The finance charges have to be allocated on the sum of digit basis. This has been classified as a finance lease. So you have to show an extract of the financial statement of the lessee at the end of the first year. Now what is finance, how much finance charge is involved here? What is the finance charge for the lease? That you have to allocate among the installments, six installments on sum of digit basis. So how much is the finance charge? Anybody? In this particular example, how much is the finance charge? Still wait for a response on your side. How much is the finance charge? Can you calculate, find out what is the finance charge involved in the lease? If you remember this particular slide which we talked about in earlier in the session, in the last session, finance charge or interest is the minimum lease payment minus liability recorded. When liability is recorded by the lessee at the lower of the present value of the amount guaranteed by the lessee or the fair value of the asset or cash price of the asset. So how much is the finance lease liability total? What is the fair value of the asset here? Still no answer? What is the fair value of the asset in this particular case? What is given in the exercise? 
Hamar is the fair value of the asset. Still no response. It's uh, it's available. It's given in the exercise. What is the fair value of the asset? Fair value of the equipment. Very good. Thank you, Hemant. So, fair value of the equipment is thirty-five thousand. So, the lease will be recorded in the lessee's book at thirty-five thousand. This is a finance lease. So, the equipment will be recorded, recognized in the. Equipment as an asset will be recorded on the asset side at thirty-five thousand. The lease liability will be also recorded at thirty-five thousand. That is at the inception of the lease. Now, what are the MLP? Minimum lease payment, how much it is? Two thousand in the beginning. Two thousand is payable at the inception of the lease, followed by six thousand five hundred into six. Six yearly installments of six thousand five hundred. So two thousand plus thirty nine thousand. So forty one thousand is the minimum lease payments under this lease. So finance charge will be. Now tell me what will be the finance charge? MLP minus liability recorded. That is finance charge. So forty one thousand minus thirty five thousand. Six thousand is the finance charge. Involved in this list is that clear to everyone? The lease liability will be recorded in the lessee's books and accounts at the inception of the lease at thirty-five thousand, which is the fair value of the asset or equivalent. Minimum lease payments is two thousand plus six thousand five hundred into six six installments of six thousand five hundred. So two thousand plus thirty-nine thousand forty-one thousand is the Minimum lease payments. So the final charge is basically minimum lease payments minus liability recorded lease liability. So forty one minus thirty five six thousand. Now six thousand has to be allocated on some of digit basis to each of the installments. So how it is allocated? We have to allocate six thousand the total final charge. To each of the installments using the sum of digit basis. So how we do it? So you have understood what is the minimum lease payment? You have understood the final charge. The final charge is six thousand. So next is allocation of final charge. First half yearly installment, second installment, third installment, fourth installment, fifth installment, and sixth installment. For this six, for this five, for this four, three, two, one. This is the last installment. <coughs> so you have to put the digit in reverse order because. Maximum allocation of finance charge will be for the first half year. Finance charge will go on decreasing as we move towards the expiry of the lease. So six five four three two one total is the digits are six five four three two one. Total is twenty one. So allocation of finance charge for the first half yearly installment will be six thousand into six by twenty one. This will be six thousand into five by twenty-one. This is sum of digit method. Six thousand into four by twenty-one, and so on. Six thousand into three by twenty-one. Six thousand into two by twenty-one, and six thousand into one by twenty-one. So the entire finance charge will get allocated to the installments like that. 
So how much it comes to? Six thousand. Why? Where did you get the six thousand five hundred from? Total finance charge. You are allocating the finance charge. Finance charge is how much? We calculated the finance charge as six thousand. You are going to allocate it to each of these installments. Total finance charge is six thousand. Is that clear? That we are allocating to the various installments, actual installments. And this is the sum of digit method. That is the basis of allocation. <coughs> So this comes to one seven one four. This comes to one four two nine. This comes to one one four three. Eight five seven. Five seven one. And two eight six. That is how the finance charge is going to be allocated. This is how the six thousand rupees of finance charge is getting allocated to each of the installments. Now, at the end of first year, the finance charge paid for the first year is this too. So we are we are looking at the lessons books of accounts at the end of first year. So what will happen at the end of first year? So the end of first year, the first two installments are paid. The so total finance charge involved is thirty-one forty-three. The total finance charge involved in the first year. So at the end of first year, in the balance sheets, let's first look at the balance sheet. In the balance sheet of the lessee equipment, thirty-five thousand is the original. That is what is recognised originally. The fair value less accumulated depreciation how much will be depreciation over a period of we are depreciating over the period of the lease three years so accumulated depreciation will be for for one year it will be one third of thirty five thousand so eleven thousand six sixty seven so the equipment will be shown at Twenty to three thousand three thirty three will be the value of the equipment shown in the balance sheet of the lessee. Twenty to three thousand three thirty three. What will be the non-current liabilities? All these liabilities, these amount payable How much this amount is still payable? Six thousand five hundred into four. At the end of first year, two installments have been paid. So this amount payable is twenty six thousand. Reduced by less future finance charge. That is finance charge for the four, fifth, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth installments. So the finance charge for future finance charge will be basically this four. So it comes to fifty-seven, twenty-eight, fifty-seven. So less two thousand eight hundred fifty-seven So twenty three thousand one forty three.
in that when I am talking about non-current liability, actually there is a current part of this also. To be precise, it should be further broken down into current and non-current. This is not on, this is not entirely non-current because two installments are payable within 12 months. That part is current. There are four installments remaining to be paid. As at the end of the first year, when you look at the balance sheet, in, as at the end of first year, two first two, third and fourth installments are payable within the 12 month period. So that part is current. Actually, uh, we are basically showing the entire lease liability here, but it has a current part and a non current part, but I don't want to go into it right now. We can further split it into current portion and non current portion. Current portion will be 13,000 minus the finance charge relating to the third and fourth installment. And the non-current portion will be 13,000 minus the finance charge relating to the fifth and sixth installment. So that should be the correct one. Yes, Now in the profit and loss account, what will happen? Profit and loss account of the lessee, finance charge and equipment should be reflected expense of the profit and loss. Finance charge and equipment means here. The finance share relating to the first and the second installment, 1714 plus 1429. So basically 31, 43 will be the finance charge on equipment. It will be reflected to the profit and loss account as an expenditure. Depreciation of the equipment, 11,667, which is one third of 35,000. 11,667. So this too will be reflected in the profit and loss account as expenditure relating to operating expenditure relating to the lease. Is that clear to everyone? So we are showing the extract of the financial statement of the lessee at the end of the first year. This is for the profit and loss statement. The other one is for the balance sheet. This is how we do it. Is the solution clear to everyone or not? If you have any doubts, you can ask me at this point of time because otherwise we are going to go to the next session now. If you have any amount of doubts left in your mind <coughs> regarding the solution which I have been provided, please ask it now so, so that I can clarify it. Otherwise we will move to the next lesson or basically talk about contingent liabilities, contingent assets and provisions. No questions yet? Very good. If there are no questions, it only indicates either of two things. Either you have understood it wholly or you have not understood it. So I hope the first one is true. Okay. <coughs> Assuming the first one to be true, that you have understood it fully, I will now move to the next lesson. So basically what you have learned here is 
about lease, that's an agreement between the lesser and lessee, which gives the right to the lessee to use an asset for a specified period of time in return for a payment or a series of payments. In a finance lease or capital lease, the title of the asset may not eventually be transferred to the lessee. It may be transferred, it may not be transferred. Just because the title of the asset doesn't get transferred to the lessee, we don't have to consider it as an operating lease, it can still be a finance lease. Operating lease is a lease other than finance terms. Finance lease, that is a lease that doesn't transfer substantially all the risk and rewards of ownership related to the ownership of the asset. So when the risk and rewards of the ownership is not substantially transferred, then we call it an operating lease. So we have seen, basically we have seen how to decide whether it is a finance lease or not. So if it is found that it is not a finance lease, we by default we take it as an operating lease. So we move to the next session now today. So here in this session we will define what is provisions, what are contingent liabilities and contingent assets. So that will be our first point we will cover, what are basically provisions, what we mean by provisions and then subsequently we will define what is contingent liabilities and contingent assets. Then we will try to understand the recognition and measurement criteria for provisions, contingent liabilities and assets. Treatment and accounting requirements in different circumstances for this kind of <coughs> provisions or contingent assets or contingent liabilities. Disclosure requirements for them and the difference between IFRS and US GAAP so far. Provisions, contingent assets and contingent liabilities are concerned. Now, first question is what is provision? The provision is a liability. But the liability is of uncertain timing or amount. We do not know when the liability has to be, is required to be discharged or how much is required to be, or exact amount for the liability may not be known to us. Either the timing or the amount may not be known to us. One of the two factors. Either the timing of the liability, that means when the liability is required to be discharged or settled, that may not be known to us, or the amount may not be known to us. Uncertain. No, known to us means it is uncertain. Okay, fine, fine. We'll change it. I think that was my mistake. I will do it. Have it changed. Let's see. I opened it wrongly, so that's why it was a problem for you. It's okay. Amount. Now the size is okay. I, I hope. Fine. So first question is what is provision? It's a liability of uncertain timing or amount. Companies every year during closing, at the time of closing their books, they make a lot of provisions of liabilities which are uncertain in timing or in amount, they make provisions for those kind of liabilities. And prior to this IS 37 which is the guiding which is the guidance for provisions like contingent assets or contingent liabilities in the under the international financial reporting standards. IS 37 is the guiding standard here. So prior to IS 37 in the absence of clear cut rules of recognition and measurement, entities could charge or create huge provisions to the income statement. When you are making provisions, you charge it to the income statement. So companies could charge huge provisions to the income statement and thereby 
Manipulate earnings or financial performance. So, since there are no clear cut rules or guidelines regarding provisioning, yes, I'll move to the next slide. Let me finish with this. <coughs> so, since before IS 37, there is no clear cut rules or guidelines regarding provisioning. So, companies sometimes in the absence of such clear cut rules, they could charge huge provisions to the income statement and thereby manipulate earnings or financial performance. Now, IS 37, which is the guideline for provisioning, prescribes rules regarding the recognition and measurement of provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets and also mandates. I will come to that one by one. Just a minute, just let me finish and then we will go to provision and discuss in detail what is provision. Okay. <coughs> so, IS 37 basically prescribed rules regarding recognition and measurement of provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets and also mandates disclosure in footnotes that would enable Users of financial statements to comprehend their nature, timing and amount. So prior to IS 37, since there was no clear cut rules or guidelines regarding provision, contingent liability or contingent assets, companies could manipulate their financial performance and earnings. Now IS 37 has come out with clear guidelines on recognition and measurement of provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets and also mandates Disclosures in footnotes, which would enable the users of the financial statements to comprehend the nature of the provisions, nature, timing and amount of the provisions, contingent assets or contingent liabilities. Now question is what is provision? We have some doubts about provision. So provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. So, creditors, trade payables, is it a provision? Right? Creditors or trade payables, Sunday creditors or trade payables, will you consider as a provision? It's also a liability. Accrued expenses, should we consider as provision? Accrued expenses are liabilities. But these are not considered provisions because they do not meet the criteria that it's a liability of uncertain timing or amount. Creditors are liabilities of certain timing and certain amount. We know so much you have to pay to our Sunday creditors. This is the this is the supply he has made. The supplier has raised the invoice. You have to pay him after three months, so the timing is known, amount is known. So it's not it's a liability, but it is not of uncertain timing or amount. Similarly, accrued expenses are liabilities but not of uncertain timing or amount. But there can be certain liabilities, there, can be, there could be some specific liabilities which are, we are, which are we are not sure about the timing when the liability should be discharged or we may not be sure exactly of the amount we have to pay to discharge that liability. Those are actually called provisions. So provisions will be reflected where? In the balance sheet. Like any other liability, provision will be reflected in the statement of financial position, which is statement of assets and liabilities. So, provision has to be reflected in the statement of financial position. It has to be recognized and measured and reflected in the statement of financial position. So, it will be how we make the provision by charging it to the income statement, by charging it to the profit. Like, like your uh, accrued expenses. It's a provision. It's not a provision. It's a liability. We create that liability by charging it to the income statement. Similarly, provisions are also created or shown in the balance sheet by charging it to the income statement. That is how they are created, how they how are recognized and measured. So, when should a provision be recognized? That is the question. 
See, loosely, loosely we say a lot of things like provision for depreciation, provision for doubtful debts. Are these provisions? Again, like sundry traders, that is trade payables or accrued expenses, they are not provisions. Similarly, provisions for depreciation, provision for doubtful debts are really not provisional, provision according to the standard. These are basically contra account, accounts or adjustments to the carrying value of the asset. So provision for depreciation is a <coughs> basically contra account which adjusts the carrying value of the asset. Similarly, provision for doubtful debts is a contra account which basically is meant to adjust the carrying value of the asset that is debts. So these are also not provisions. Okay, so when is the provision recognized? The provision should be recognized. Number one, and when an entity has a present obligation, the obligation could be due to legal or constructive in nature. What is legal, what is constructive, we will also discuss in detail, but allow me the time. We will come to that point also. What do you mean by legal liability or legal obligation and what is constructive obligation? That also we will discuss with some example when time comes. So entity has a present obligation as a result of a past event, that is very, very important. As a result of a past obligating event, the entity has a present obligation which is either a legal or constructive. Secondly, it is probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation. Sometimes there can be obligation, but we did not have it is, not, it is not probable that outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to meet the obligation. Here, IFR, IS 37 to apply for a provision to be recognized in the books of accounts or balance sheet, it is also necessary that it is probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation. And thirdly, a reliable estimate can be made of the amount of the obligation. Although it is uncertain amount, but still a reliable estimate can be made of the amount of the obligation. So three conditions must be satisfied for recognizing a liability or obligation as a provision in the books of accounts. These all three, all three conditions must be met. <coughs> That's very important to understand. If one of the condition is met, the other is not met, then we cannot <coughs> recognize that liability or obligation as a provision. Number one, an entity has a present obligation legal or constructive as a result of past event. Second, it is probable that an outflow of economic resources or resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle that obligation or discharge that obligation. And thirdly, a reliable estimate can be made of the amount of the obligation. If all these three conditions are made, then a provision should be recognized. IS 37 is very clear on this. So you have to understand trade payable assembly creditors, accrued expenses, provision for doubtful dates, provision for depreciation, these are not really provisions as per accounting standard IS 37. The provision is nothing but a liability of uncertain timing or amount and it should be recognized when all these three conditions are met. So present obligation can be legal, either legal or constructive. So what do you mean by legal and what do you mean by constructive? A legal obligation is created by a contractual agreement, legislation or law. A legal, legal obligation is normally created either by entering into a contract, so a contractual agreement, or if the government brings out a, or there is a legislation of the government which creates that obligation, or the law requires that obligation. So that is called legal obligation. Constructive obligation comes, to, comes into existence not due to contractual agreement, legislation or law, but it comes into existence as a result of the entity's action that is implied, that create valid expectations in the mind of parties. 
सर्कंस्टेटिव ऑब्लिगेशन नॉर्मली कम्स इन टू एग्जिस्टेंस ड्यू टू एंटी डिस्पास्ट एक्शन और स्टेटमेंट्स दैट क्रिएट वैलिड एक्सपेक्टेशन इन द माइंड ऑफ द पार्टीज So legal obligation is an obligation that could be contractual. It could arise due to legislation, a law passed by the parliament, or results from the operation of the law itself. The constructive obligation, however, is an obligation that results from the entity's actions where, by an established pattern of past practices, published policies, or a sufficiently current, specific current statement. The entity has indicated to the other third parties that it will accept certain responsibilities, and as a result, the entity has created a valid expectations in the mind of those parties that it will discharge those responsibilities. That is what is called a constructive obligation. It comes into existence basically not due to operation of law, not due to legislation, or not due to an agreement, but it comes into existence as a result of the entity's actions. Where, by an established pattern of past practices, or published policies, or a sufficiently specific current statement, the entity has indicated to third parties or others that it will accept certain responsibilities, and as a result, the entity has created a valid expectation in the mind of those parties that it will discharge those responsibilities. That is how a constructive obligation gets created. Let's look at a case study of constructive obligation to understand it better. Tax. An entity is into the business of exploring oil off the shores of an island. So, entity is doing offshore drilling. They are, they are basically exploring oil off the shores of an island. Despite all efforts, there is a major oil spill. That has happened, which has seen protests from the environmentalists and drawn media attention. Although there is no law that would require it to pay anything for the oil spill, there is no law requiring the entity to pay anything for the oil spill or damage to the environment. However, the entity has often stated clearly that it is conscious of its responsibilities towards the environment and will make good any losses. That may result from its exploration. The policy has been widely publicised, and the CEO has acknowledged this policy in annual meetings. Does this give rise to an obligating event to make a provision? So this is the facts of the case. So what's your opinion? Does this give rise to an obligating event to make a provision? Is there an obligation constructive? Basically, my question is: Is there an obligation on the part of the entity which is constructive, not legal, because the law doesn't require the entity to pay for any loss or damage happening to the environment due to the oil spill? The law doesn't require it, but the entity has itself clearly stated that it is conscious of its responsibilities towards the environment. And will make good any loss that may result from its exploration. This policy has been widely publicised, and the CEO of the company has acknowledged this policy in annual meetings. So, does this give rise to an obligating event to make a provision? That is the question. So, what do you feel? Does this create a valid expectation in the minds of the other parties? That the entity will be making good any loss or damage to the environment. So, what is the what is the basically observation on this? What do you feel? What is the answer to this question? Does this give rise to an obligating event to make a provision or doesn't? There is a constructive obligation. Fine. Okay. Fine. Good. I also agree. So this gives rise to an obligating event to make a provision because 
This is a constructive obligation. It may not be due to operation of law, may not be due to legislation or any contract, but still there is a constructive obligation. So there should be a provision. <coughs> I hope you have understood what is constructive obligation by this. So there is present obligation as a result of a past obligating event. Obligating event is the oil spill. What is the obligating event here? The oil spill. So there is a present obligation constructive as a result of a past obligating event which is the oil spill. Because there is no legislation in place that would make cleanup mandatory for any for any entity operate, operating there in that island, hence there is no legal obligation. So if there are a law, there would have been legal obligation. Since there is no legislation in place that would make cleanup mandatory for any entity operating in that island, hence there is no legal obligation. However, circumstances surrounding the issue clearly indicate that there is a constructive obligation since the company with its advertised policies and public statement has created an expectation in the minds of the public at large that it will honor its environmental obligations. Second thing, an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits in settlements, probable, to make to, to uh, basically to clear up that oil spill, etc. Some money will be required to be spent. So an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits in settlement, yes, probable. Conclusion, a provision should be recognized for the best estimate of the cost to clean up the oil spill. So estimate can be made, best estimate to clean up the oil spill should be made and a provision should be made or should be recognized for the best estimate of the cost to clean up the oil spill. The amount to be recognized as a provision is the best estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation at the balance sheet. Not today, at the balance sheet. So the amount to be recognized as a provision is the best estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation at the balance sheet date. Normally these techniques are used. If a group of items is being measured, we go by the expected value. If a single obligation is being measured, most likely outcome. So if a group of items is being measured on provision, best estimates have to be made, then we take the expected value. If a single ob obligation is being measured, then we take the most likely outcome. So the amount to be recognized as a provision is the best estimate, estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation at the balance sheet date. When a reliable estimate is usually possible, in rare circumstances it may not be possible to rely, obtain reliable estimate. Please understand. Most cases it is possible to get a reliable estimate. But in rare cases, it may not even be possible to get a reliable estimate. In such cases, we cannot recognize the liability as a provision. The liability will be disclosed as a contingent liability but not as a provision. We will come to contingent liability subsequently. It will be disclosed as a contingent liability through footnotes in the financial statements but it cannot be recognized as a provision as long as the reliable estimate is obtainable. We can recognize and measure it as a provision and put it in the balance sheet. If reliable estimate is not available, not possible to obtain any reliable estimate, then we cannot recognize it as a provision in the statement of financial position. We will only recognize it as a contingent liability. It should be disclosed as a contingent liability and not recognized as a provision. Again, best estimate is a matter of judgment. When I talk of best estimate, it is a matter of judgment and is usually based on past experience with similar transactions, evidence provided by technical or legal experts, or additional evidence provided by events after the balance sheet. Risk and uncertainties surrounding events and circumstances should be considered in arriving at the best estimate of a provision. 
if you are measuring a group of items, it is the expected value that should be taken. When you are single obligation you are measuring, it should be the most likely outcome. We have to consider the most likely outcome. We will see an example here. Example of expected outcome. Let's look at this example to understand. A limited sales goods with warranty. That is, cost of repairing any manufacturing defects are covered during the first 12 months after the purchase. That happens with most of the, many of the goods. So first 12 months any defect, manufacturing defect will be <coughs> repaired or cost of repair will be covered by the manufacturer. If minor defects are defected, 10,000 expenditure will occur. If a minor defect happens, then cost of repair is around about 10,000. If major defects are detected, 40,000 will occur. Going by the past experience and future expectation, the indicators are 75% of the products will have no defects, 20% of the products only will have minor defects and 5% will have major defects. This is based on the past experience and future expectations. Calculate the provision required in financial statement in respect of this warranty. Now, there is, you, this uh, warranty is basically when you are selling products with a warranty, there is some obligation, legal obligation of uncertain timing or amount. When that obligation is required to be settled, how much to be settled, these are not known to us in advance. So, there is a legal obligation of uncertain timing amount. It is probable that benefits, that resources embodying economic benefits, there will be outflow because you have to pay money for the defects to be repaired and all that. So, we have to obtain what is the best estimate. So, since here, <coughs> we are talking of a large number of items being sold, large number of products being sold. So, we are talking of a group of items. So, we will go by the expected value, expected outcome. Okay, we are not measuring a single, we are not measuring how much you have to, for a single item that is sold. There are companies may be selling a large number of items like that, large number of articles like that with the warranty. So, we have to make a provision for that warranty, under that warranty. So, since it is a group of items, we go by the expected value. So, we know the probabilities. 75% will have no defects, so no expenditure involved. For 75% of the products, there are no defects or no expenditure involved. In respect of 20%, we will have minor defects. So, for repairing minor defects, the expenditure involved is 10,000. And for 5% cases, we will have major defects, the cost will be 40,000. So, the expected results, expected value calculation are used in case of large population. So, for 4,000 is the expected provision for warranty that should be made for each product. For each product that is sold during the year, on the balance sheet date, if the company has sold, let's say, 10,000 products, so 10,000 into 4,000, 40,000 is the estimate, or 40,000 should be the provision for the warranty. Is that clear? So this is how we use the expected outcome. We take the expected value. For a large number of items, we normally go by expected value for a single item or for single obligating event, we will go for the most likely outcome. So, if the company has to make a provision at the end of the year for the warranty, towards warranty, they will take into account the number of products sold during last 12 months, these are still within warranty, the number of products sold <coughs> and multiplied by 4,000. We'll see another example. B Limited has an obligation to restore a seabed from the damage it has caused in the past. It 
it has to pay $1 million in cash on 31st December 2007 with respect to this liability. B Limited's management considered that 15% is an appropriate discount rate. The time value of the money is considered to be material. Calculate the amount of provision to be considered in the financial statement at 31st December 2015 for the cost to restore the receivable. One million has to be paid in cash on 31st December 2017 with respect to this liability. So how much provision should be made in the Bay Limited financial statement as on 31st December 2015? That is two years prior to the date of payment of this one million. And 15% is the discounting rate. So whether B Limited will do a 1 million provisioning at that point of time on 31st December 2015 or less. So what it will do is basically how much provision should be identified as on 31st December 2015 is the present value of 1 million which is to be paid on 31st December 2017. So 15% being the discounting rate we have to discount that 1 million using the 15% discounting rate, so 30, 1 million divided by 1.15 into 1.15. So it comes to 756,144. That should be the provision to be made in B Limited's book as on 31st December 2015. For the FY 2016 and 2017, the provision will increase with the finance charge. So in 2016, the provision will be further increased using a finance by debiting finance charge account. So how much will be the finance charge? 756,144 into 15%. So 113,422 will be the increase in provision by debiting finance charge account, by, by charging it to the finance charge. That will be the increase in the provision in FY 2016. And in FY 2017, again, the provision will be further increased by the finance charge on the existing provision that is 756,144 plus 113,422 that is the provision at the end of 2016. So another finance charge of 15% will be applied on that. It will be 134,34. So again it will be charged to the income and expenditure account to the finance charge account, finance charge of 134,34 and provision will be raised to 1 million. So as on 31st December 2017 on that day balance sheet will show a provision of 1 million available. So that money will be available for payment on 31st December 2017 to settle that obligation. That is how provision has to be made. So that is important to understand what we are doing here is We are basically making the estimate of the expenditure required to settle the present obligation at the balance sheet date. 1.15 is the discounting factor, 15% is the discounting rate. Don't, exp don't expect me to explain discounting for GFS class. Okay. When you discount, when you calculate the present value of a future value, we call it discounting. So 15% is the discounting rate. So if you want to discount 1 million over a period of 2 years, we are, we, are, we are talking of the present value of 1 million as on 31st December 2015. 1 million will be required on 31st December 2017, right? That will be the obligation will be settled at 1 million, but that will be on 31st December 2017. We are calculating the present value of 1 million as on 31st December 2015, that is 2 years before the data of settlement. So how do you calculate present value of a future value? The future value is 1 million. So you divide the future value by the discounting factor. So for 2 years the discounting factor will be 1.15 square, 1.15 into 1.15. So that's how we get, that's how 1.15 comes. Is that clear I hope to all of you?
So this is nothing but we are calculating the present value our value as on 31st December 2015 of 1 million settlement that will be required on 31st December 2017. We are calculating the present value of that. That's why we are dividing it by the discounting factor 1.15 into 1.15. Two years, so it is 1.15 into 1.15. One year means it will be only 1.15. And the provision has to be again raised at the end of 2016, the provision has to be increased by the finance charge of 15% on this amount. So the provision has to be increased by 113422 in 2016. Now the new provision will be 756144 plus 113422, that will be the new provision as on 31st December 2016, which will again be raised by another 15% to finance charge of 15% in 2017. So the ultimately on 31st December 2017, the provision in the books will be exactly 1 million, which will be adequate to settle the obligation. Is that clear so far? So we'll have a short break at this point of time.
Welcome back after the break. <coughs> Provision once made can be changed. As we have seen in the last example, provision was made on 31st of December 2015. Again, the provision was raised by the finance charge on 31st December 2016 and again by the finance charge for the year 2017 at 15%. So at every reporting date, it is necessary to review and, add the, and adjust the amount of an existing provision. If more provisions are needed, it can be added. If less provisioning, if there is a reduction necessary, it can be also reduced. If the provision is no longer required, the idea provision may be reversed. So at every reporting date, provisions which have been made earlier can be reviewed and adjusted. So changes in provision shall be reviewed at each balance sheet date and the amount of provision should be adjusted accordingly to reflect the current best estimate. When it is no longer probable that outflow of resources would be required to settle the obligation, the provision should be reversed. The provision should be used only for the purpose for which it was originally recognized or set up. It should not be used for other purposes. If a provision was created for a particular purpose, it should be used only for that purpose and no other purpose. If it is not required, it will be reversed. If there is no, if there is, it is no longer probable that outflow of resources will be required to settle the obligation, the provision can be reversed in totality. Now we come to what is called contingent liability something very similar to provision, but contingent liability cannot be recognized in the balance sheet or statement of financial position. So what is a contingent liability? A possible obligation that arises from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events not wholly within the control of the entity. So, contingent liability is also a possible obligation which arises from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events not wholly within the control of the entity. Or it can be a present obligation that arises from past events but is not recognized because it is either, either of two reasons. It is not probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation or the amount of obligation cannot be measured with sufficient reliability. So, a contingent liability is either a possible obligation or a present obligation. <coughs> a possible obligation that arises from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events not only within the control of the entity. That is one condition. The other could be a present obligation that arises from past events but is not recognized because either it is not probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation or the amount of the obligation cannot be measured with sufficient reliability. So an entity is not required to recognize a contingent liability. A contingent liability like unlike a provision, provision will be recognized but a contingent liability will not be recognized. An entity should only disclose a contingent liability unless the possibility of an outflow of resources embodying the economic benefits is remote. If the Possibility of an outflow of economic resources <coughs> or resources embodying economic benefits is remote then it is not even necessary to disclose the contingent liability. <coughs> so basically we have seen that one of the prescribed conditions is not satisfied then a provision cannot be recognized. There are three conditions for recognition of a provision. 
if one of the prescribed condition is not satisfied, then a provision cannot be recognized. It is then a contingent plan. You remember all three conditions for <laughs> recognition of provision. We will go back to that slide once more. <coughs> We like to go back to the slide once more. <coughs> These are the three conditions for recognition, recognizing a provision. Number one, it is a present obligation as a result of past event. Number two, it is probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation. And number three, reliable estimate can be made of the amount of obligation. If any of these three conditions are not satisfied, any or more of these three conditions are not satisfied, then we can, need not recognize as a provision, it can be disposed as a contingent liability. That means, if it is not a present obligation, it is a possible obligation, but not a present one. Or if it is not probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation or a reliable estimate cannot be made of the amount of obligation, then we can treat it as a contingent liability. So, the entity should not recognize a contingent liability, an entity should only disclose a contingent liability unless that is also not necessary, that won't be necessary if the possibility of an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits is remote. Once recognized as a continuing liability or disclosed as a continuing liability, an entity should continually assess the probability of the outflow of the future economic benefits relating to that contingent liability. If the probability of the outflow of the future economic benefits changes to more likely than not, then the contingent liability may develop into an actual liability and would need be recognized as a provision. So, once a contingent liability is disclosed, then on the entity should continually assess the probability of the outflow of the future economic benefits relating to that contingent liability. If the probability of the outflow of the future economic benefits changes to more likely than not, then the contingent liability may develop into an actual liability and would need to be recognized as a provision. So the stable displays the comparison between liability, provision and contingent liability. Liability. Liability is a present obligation as a result of past event and there will be outflow of economic benefits. Provision is a liability of uncertain timing and amount. Timing or amount. And contingent liability is a possible obligation or a present obligation, but outflow is not probable and or no reliable estimate allowed. So, these are the differences between liability, provision and contingent liability. Liability is more definite, it is a present obligation arising out of past events and it will result in outflow of economic benefits and the amount can be measured, timing is known. That is a liability. Like actual expenses, trade credit, trade creditors, these are liabilities. Interest, interest liability, these are liability. We know for sure this is arising out of a past event. <coughs> it's a present obligation and it will result in outflow of economic benefits. The amount also can be measured. Certainly. Provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. It's a present obligation arising out of past event, but the, uh, but the timing is uncertain or the amount may be uncertain. Contingent liability it could be a possible obligation or a present obligation, but outflow may not is not probable or no reliable estimate of the amount can be possible. These are the differences between liability 
provision and contingent liability. For liability will be recognized when outflow is probable, reliably measurable, thus the outcome is certain, if met recognized in statement of a financial position. The provision recognition will happen when present obligation as a result of past event, either it could be legal or constructive, outflow is probable, reliable estimate of amount is possible. Thus the outcome is more likely than not, that is more than 50 percent. More likely than not means more than 50 percent probability. <laughs> if met, recognize in the statement of initial position. If all the conditions are met, it should be recognized in the statement of financial position. Contingent liability, no recognition is needed. Since the outcome is not likely, that is less than 50 percent, if as preceding, no recognition in statement of financial position, instead disclosure is provided through footnotes in the financial statement. So it will not appear, a contingent liability will not appear in the balance sheet or statement of financial position, but it has to be disclosed or it may be disclosed rather <laughs> when in the by way of footnotes in the balance sheet. So the users of the financial statements are made aware of this possible or present obligation which may, <coughs> may not result in outflow of economic, outflow of resource embodying economic benefits or whose amount cannot be reliably determined. So the decision tree for under IS 37 is something like this. This is the decision tree. First you have to look at whether the obligation is a present obligation as a result of an obligating event in the past. If it is yes, then we ascertain whether there will be a probable outflow of resources embodying economic benefits or no. If yes, can we have a reliable estimate of how much outflow will take place? If yes, then make a provision. So all three, com all three conditions are to be satisfied. Present obligation plus global outflow, plus reliable estimate, all these three conditions, if they are met, then we make a provision. Okay. So three conditions are very important. What is that is present obligation as a result of an obligating event in the past. Second condition, there will be probable outflow of resources embodying economic benefits to settle the obligation. And third condition is whether a reliable estimate is possible or can be obtained regarding the amount of outflow. If all three conditions are made, then it's a provision, it should be measured and reflected in the statement of financial position. If it is not a present obligation as a result of an obligating event, is it a possible obligation? If yes, whether there is a possibility of outflow of resources embodying economic benefits, if yes, but reliable estimate is not possible, then disclose only the continuing liability. If it is not a possible obligation or if there is no probable outflow or it is remote, then do nothing. You don't have to disclose anything. You can have also another situation when there is a present obligation as a result of an obligating event, there would be a possible outflow of resources embodying economic benefits to settle the obligation, but no reliable estimate is possible. It is very rare that it happens. Then also disclose as a contingent liability. So two of the conditions are made, but the third condition regarding reliable estimate not up, is, is not obtainable then disclose it as a continuous liability, not as a provision. For provisioning, you must have all three conditions must be met. For disclosing as a continuous liability, it could be 
a present obligation in which there could be verbal outflow but no reliable estimate. Or it could be a possible obligation with a probability of economy of outflow. But it is a possible obligation, not a present obligation. Then it will be discussed as a contingent liability. If it is a present obligation as a result of an obligating event and the probability of outflow is remote, then you do not have to do anything. But if there is a present obligation as a result of an obligating event and there is a possibility of outflow, that the estimate, reliable estimate cannot be made, then it should be disclosed as a continuous liability. So these are the various situations or decision tree which helps us to take decision whether a particular liability, whether present or possible, should be recognized as a provision or be disclosed as a contingent liability by way of footnotes in the statement of financial position. I hope you have now understood the difference between <coughs> provision and contingent liability and also other liabilities. So let us look at provision and other liabilities. This table represents the provision distinguished from other liabilities like trade payables and accruals. Trade payables are liabilities to pay for goods, services received, supplied and invoice formally agreed with the supplier. So the liability to pay for goods or services received or supplied which have been invoiced or whether there is a formal agreement to the supplier, even though it is not invoiced, there is an agreement to the supplier regarding how much you have to pay and when you have to pay. Then these are basically trade payables because here these are obligations, present obligations arising from past events, that means supply of goods made or services made and the amount and timing are certain. So this will be treated as liabilities. Similarly, accruals. Accruals are basically liabilities to pay for goods or services received, supplied, but not yet paid, invoiced or formally agreed with the supplier, including amount due to employees. Sometimes the amount to be paid is not yet, the supplier has not yet invoiced you or you have no formal agreement with the supplier to determine that amount. It can be uncertain timings or amount, but, uncert but uncertainty is comparatively less. So there could be some uncertainty regarding timings or amounts in case of accruals. But the uncertainty is less. So this is often reported as part of the trade tables or otherwise it can be reported separately as accruals. So provision is recognized strictly within the definition and recognition criteria of this standard since Hence, as stated earlier, creditors and accrued expenses are therefore not considered provisions by this standard because they do not meet the standards criteria. But threat payables and accrued expenses are liabilities shown as current liability in the balance sheet to the extent payable within a year and considered under the financial instruments IS 39. The guiding standard is IS 39, which we will be discussing subsequently. Now, having discussed provision and contingent liabilities, then we come to the definition of what we call contingent asset. A contingent asset is a possible asset. Instead of liability or obligation, it is a possible asset arising from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events that are not completely within the control of the entity. That is the definition of contingent asset, very similar to contingent liability. It is a possible asset, not a present asset. So contingent asset is always a possible asset arising from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events that are not completely within the control of the entity. So we look at a case study relating to a contingent asset. 
to make you the example, understand the example of the contingent asset we look at this case study. Air Limited is a shipping company that lost an entire shipload of cargo valued at 5 million on a voyage to US. The cargo was lost during the voyage to US. The cargo was valued at 5 million US dollar. It is however covered by an insurance policy. According to the report of the surveyor, surveyor is the person engaged by the insurance policy to determine the amount of damage. So according to the report of the surveyor, the amount is correctable subject to the deductible clause that is 10% of the claim. There is a deductible clause that 10% of the loss is actually borne by the insure, insured company which has taken the insurance policy, the buyer of the policy. So that is called deductible. So this, according to the report of the surveyor, the amount is correctable subject to the deductible clause that is 10% of the claim in the insurance policy. So how much they can get? They can get 4.5 million, that is 5 million, 10% of 5 million is half million. So that will be deductible. So 4.5 million can be received by way of insurance claim. Before year end, the shipping company received a letter from the insurance company that a check was in the mail for 90% of the claim. The company now would be did to recognize a contingent asset of 4.5 million, the amount that is virtually certain of collection. They have not received the check yet. Check is in the mail that has been confirmed to the insurance company. They are mailing the check for 90% of the amount claimed. That means 4.5 million. The shipping company would now need to recognize a contingent asset of 4.5 million, the amount that is virtually certain of collection, but yet not yet received by the shipping company. So this is an exa example of a contingent asset. So we will not talk about the difference between IFRS and EVS gap so far. Contingent assets, contingent liabilities and provision is concerned. So the recognition threshold, threshold the area, first area we will discuss is recognition threshold. The guiding, the guidance under IFRS is IS 37, under US gap it is ASC 450. Under IFRS or IS 37, a loss must be probable that is more likely than not to be recognized. More likely than not refers to a probability of greater than 50%. Under US gap, a loss must be probable in which probability is interpreted as likely. Probability is interpreted as not more likely than not but as likely to be recognized. It does not ascribe a percentage to probability. It is intended to denote a high likelihood, for example, 70% or more. But IFRS is very specific, more likely that not. Under US gap, it is probable is interpreted as likely. Although there is no percentage, no, no particular percentage is ascribed to probable, it is interpreted. Normal interpretation is that it denotes a high likelihood more than 70% or more. So this is one area of difference. Then discounting of provision, second idea. Under IS 37, provision should be recorded at the estimated amount to settle or transfer the obligation taking into consideration the time value of money. That we have seen an example where 1 million has to be provided for. If the obligation will be settled after 2 years at 1 million so that when you we have to do the provision in 2015, we take the discounted value of 1 million. So, taking considering the time value of money. So, provision should be recorded at the estimated amount to settle or transfer the obligation, taking into consideration the time value of money. Whereas under EUS gap, provision may be discounted only when the amount of the liability and the timing of the payments are fixed or reliably determinable or when the obligation is a fair value of so here also discounting is possible, but only when the amount of the liability and the timing of the payments are fixed or reliably determinable or when the obligation is a fair value obligation. So we look at an example to end up our discussion on provision, contingent liabilities and contingent asset. XYZ Limited purchased an asset on 1st of January 2012. 
the company is committed to an expenditure of 10 million in 10 years of time in respect of this asset. This obligation satisfies the recognition criteria of IS 37. An appropriate discount factor is 8%. So how this will be accounted for in the FOI ending 2012? They purchased the asset on 1st January 2012. They are committed to an expenditure of 10 million in 10 years of time in respect of this asset and this obligation satisfies the recognition criteria of IS 37. So an appropriate discount factor, you have to consider the time value of money, an appropriate discount factor is 8%. So how this will be accounted for the FY ending 2012? So on 1-1-2012, one, one, the day the asset is acquired, initial measurement of provision will be How much is the initial measurement of provision will be 10 million. We have to take the discounted value over 10 years at 8%. So it is 1.08 to the power of 10. So on 1 1 2012, we have to recognize the provision or the amount that will be recognized for the provisioning will be the discounted value of 10 million at the end of 10 years. So you have to get it by dividing 10 million by 1.08, 8% being the discount rate, discount factor. So 1.08 to the power of 10. So the amount comes to 4631.95. This will be the initial measurement of the provision. So what will happen? We will debit asset account. Debit asset 4631.95 and credit provision account the same amount on 1-1-2012. That is on 1-1-2012 on the date of acquisition of the asset, purchase of the asset. What will happen on 31-12? 2002, we have to add the finance charge for unwinding of the discount. How much will be the finance charge in one year? 8% of 4631.95. So on 31-12-2012, we have to unwind the finance charge. We have to basically the finance charge for unwinding of the discount. We have to now unwind the discount. Discount has been already taken, we have already discounted, so we have to unwind the discount for one year. So it is in the form of a finance charge. So how much will be the finance charge? For unwinding the discount that will be 8% of 4631.95 which will be 375.55 so this will be the finance charge so on 31-12-2012 when the books of the books are being closed we have to debit expense account this is on 31-12-2012 we debit expense account, that is finance chart, C7555 and credit provision C7555. So what will be the balance in the provision account now? We we'll also have to debit depreciation four six three one ninety five has to be depreciated now over ten years into one by ten. 
So 463.193 will be debited to the requisition account and credited to the asset account. So the depreciation will be charged on that amount of 463.1935 which was the discounted value of the 10 million which he added to the, which he basically earlier debited to the asset account but it will be depreciated to the extent of 1 by 10, 10%. 10 percent. So 463.193 will be the depreciation charge which will be created to the asset account. And final charge for unwinding the discount for one year will be 8% of 463.195 that is 375.55 it will be debited to the expense account and ultimately will be charged to the profit and loss and provision account will be created with 375.55. This way every year the finance charge for unwinding the discount will take place from now on and depreciation will be made against that asset. That is how it has to be adjusted. Is that clear? Any questions? Any doubts? Please have it clarified because if you have any doubts, please have it clarified now. So for each of these 10 years, finance charge for unwinding the discount will be applied at 8% of the amount held in the provision account. So it will be charged to the PNL and depreciation of the asset will be made at the rate of 10% of the 4631.95 by credit to the asset account. So at the end of the 10 years, this 463 195 will be completely depreciated in the asset account and the uh, amount of depreciation available, amount of provision available at the end of 10 years will be exactly 10 million. This is the concept of <coughs> calculating the discounted, basically you estimate the provision, the reliable estimate of the expenses involved in settling the obligation on a future date and then take its discounted value at the end of each year. Uh, I do not know the dates. Actually, between two cycle tests you have normally, uh, I have to check up the dates. Uh, but between uh, your second and third cycle test, I think the, there is a two-week gap. So I hope uh, your cycle test was on what day, 15th. I think it should be around 29th or so. Maybe around 29th April. You can, you can check your own schedule. You can, you can check it. From your own schedule, you can find it out. You can go to the schedule and just check it. But my... Uh, Expectation it will be around the end of the month, say 29th April maybe, that is next Saturday possibly. So the thing we are going to talk about, we, we may just start on this topic today, that is the concept of scope, concept and application of current taxes and deferred taxes. So we are going to talk about taxation and the accounting standards which apply to taxation matters. I mean accounting treatment of taxes and all that. So we'll understand the scope, concept and application of current taxes and default taxes, the concept of calculating the tax base, temporary differences, current tax, default taxes and subsequent year adjustments.
the presentation and disclosure requirement regarding deferred tax, etc., and difference between IFRS and US GAAP for this particular area. This is actually covered under IS-12, right? The standard we are going to discuss here is the IS-12, International Accounting Standard 12. The concept of deferred tax has been introduced to this particular accounting standards. The main reason why IS-12 deferred tax has to be provided for is that international financial reporting standard recognition criteria are different from those that are normally set out in tax law. See, tax law is a separate law altogether and tax laws differ from country to country. Every country has its own tax law. Now, deferred tax has to be provided for because IFRS recognition criteria are different from those that are normally set out in the tax law. Tax law requires you to pay tax in a certain way for that the accounting treatment or <coughs> could be different. Whereas under the IFRS the accounting treatment or again is different from the, the those set out in the tax laws. Thus there will be income and expenditure in financial statements. There could be income and expenditure in financial statements under IFRS that will not be allowed for taxation purpose under the tax laws. So certain income which may be reported in the other the IFRS may not be taxed under the tax laws. Or certain expenditures which are reported using the reporting standards of IFRS may not be considered by the tax laws as expenditure. So tax laws are basically a different set of laws from the reporting standards of IFRS. And the tax laws are different in different countries. So there will be income and expenditure in financial statements that would not be allowed for taxation purpose in tax laws. Of a particular country. Thus there are differences in treatment of taxation as per accounting laws the way we treat taxation. And the treatment under taxation laws could be different. So this standard IS-12 basically deals with accounting of treatment under the two laws. Please understand, when a company prepares its statement of financial position or balance sheet, etc., uh, or, or profit and loss account, it follows the accounting treatment required under IFRS. Now when it comes to payment of actual taxes to the taxation authorities of the country where the company is located, they have to pay taxes as per the tax laws. So this requirement of tax laws could be different from the requirement of IFRS. You have to understand and appreciate that. So the tax required to be paid as calculated, computed under IFRS could be different from the tax actually required to be paid under the tax laws of that country. So how we account for the difference. The difference supposing the company is required to as per the as per the accounting financial statements prepared by the company under IFRS they have to pay 1 million of taxes. That is the tax calculation comes to 1 million. But actually they have to pay 1 half million of taxes under the tax laws of that country. So how we account for the difference between tax payable as per IFRS and tax payable as per the tax laws of that country. It could be the other way around in the company may have to, as per, the, as per the IFRS, the company calculates its tax liability or tax payments at 1 million, but actual tax payment may be 0.75 million as per the tax law. So how do you account for the difference? How do you show the difference? So that is what IS-12 is meant for. The concept of deferred tax, uh, deferred tax asset and deferred tax liabilities, they, they are actually arise from IS-12. So the objective of the IS-12 is to prescribe the accounting treatment for income taxes. So the main issue addressed in IS-12 is the accounting for the current and future tax consequences. What is the current tax and what is the future tax consequences? These are addressed to IS-12. <coughs> so transactions and events of the current period of an entity's financial statements so, IS-12 basically prescribes accounting treatment for income tax, 
the main issue is how to determine accounting for current and future tax consequences of transaction events of the current period in an is financial statement or profit or loss. The future recovery or settlement of carrying amount of assets or liabilities in an entity's statement of financial position. How if the if tax laws have to be if taxes have to be paid in future or it has to be recovered in future, so the future recovery or settlement of the carrying amount of assets or liabilities in an entity's <coughs> statement of financial statement. What is the question from Shivam? Comprehensive balance sheet. Where do you come across this term? In what context you have come across that uh, comprehensive balance sheet? That's, that's an asking is the question now. Did you come across that term somewhere? Comprehensive balance sheet. In a particular, I am trying to understand the context in which you are. It came across this particular phrase. See, current tax and future tax is basically what we are required to pay currently as per the tax laws this year and what we may have to pay in future. As I told you the example, <coughs> supposing a company calculates the tax liability based on IFRS, so it prepares its profit and loss account as per the International Financial Reporting Standard. So, based on that, the company calculates profit, it, it comes out, the, it, it results in a particular level of profit. And on that it calculates its tax liability. Okay? Now, some income and expenditure which have been included in the profit and loss account statement under IFRS, as per the tax laws of that country, those some of those income or expenditure may not be recognized. Okay, let me give an example. Supposing the company is depreciating its assets, I am giving a specific example. Company is depreciating its asset at let's say a certain rate of let's say seventy five percent each year, which is allowed for that particular kind of asset. It is allowed. So twenty five percent. Supposing the asset is one million, so two hundred fifty thousand they are depreciating each year. So that is an expenditure which is they are recognizing in the profit and loss account. But the tax law of that country. Say allows 50 percent as a depreciation rate. So, using when when it comes to payment of tax, the profit will be calculated using half a million as the depreciation. So, the profit will be reduced by when the tax tax people will calculate the profit, they will reduce the profit by to 50,000. Let's say, let's take an example. Just before we proceed further, let me try to understand what is current tax and future tax. Let's say that a company's profit is based on based on depreciation of have an asset at twenty five percent. The profit is let's say seven fifty thousand is the profit shown in the profit and loss account, and the tax will be accordingly calculated on seven fifty thousand. That is the tax the company is required to pay. Now the tax laws allows depreciation at 50 percent, that is the tax law. Tax law of the country that asset can be depreciated at 50 percent. So under that, using that depreciation the profit becomes 500,000 because the depreciation is higher. So under the tax law, the company will have to pay, let us say 30 percent is the tax, company will be required to pay 150,000 as the actual tax, but under this, the same 30 percent the company will be required to pay a tax of how much, 225,000. So in the profit and loss account as prepared as per IFRS company will show tax liability at 225,000 or tax on the profit at 225,000, but actually they are paying out as per the tax law 150,000. What about that 75,000 that has to be paid? Subsequently, the seventy-five thousand, the difference is a basically deferred tax liability because next year the company 
will again depreciate the asset is 50% so next year also another 225,000 assuming the profit remains same next year also another 75,000 remains as deferred tax asset liability but eventually when the asset is fully depreciated over two years as per the tax laws after that no more depreciation will be chargeable on the asset depreciation is expense that expense cannot be charged anymore so the third year when the company makes the same amount of profit as per tax law they have to pay higher amount of tax so let's let's take a four year situation in the first two years so let's take a four year situation year one assuming the profit to remain same year one two three four as per IFRS of the profit and loss account statement prepared as per IFRS, depreciation is 250,000 each year. Total asset value is 1 million. This is depreciation and profit is 750. Let's say profit is also 7 after challenging the depreciation. This is as per IFRS. Let's say, as per tax law, depreciation in year 1 will be 500, year 2 will be 500, 500,000 and 500,000, profit will be again 500,000 and 500,000. But in the third and fourth year, there will be no further depreciation to be charged here. So the profit will be 750,000 and 750,000. Now this two according to the company's calculation the tax took the tax in this in this first year is 225, 225, 225 and 225. All four years same tax. But according to tax calculation, tax loss calculation, the profit the tax in this year will be 150, 150, but tax in this two years will be 225 and 225. No, this will be 1000 now because now the profit will be 1000 because no depreciation is charged, so tax will be 300 and 300. So here the company is actually making a provision of 225,000 for the tax but paying a tax of 150,000. So the remaining 75,000 is a deferred tax liability. That is a future tax company has to pay. Again, here the same thing. Okay, but here the company, whatever tax they are calculating, it is short of the actual tax payable by 75,000. This 75,000 will be required to make the tax liability, this 75,000 will be required to pay the future tax. Overall company is paying the same, making the same amount of depreciation, paying the same amount of tax. But the timing are different. So here they are required to pay in the first year less tax under the tax law. That, but but the extra amount will be treated as a liability because it has to be paid in a future point of time. Okay, so we will discuss it in more details in the next session for understanding what is future tax and current tax. Okay, so please complete your feedback today because we, uh, we are short of time and I cannot uh, possibly explain it today in today's session. Complete explanation. So rather we will do it in the next day. So please complete your feedback.